very good afternoon to all of you and very warm welcome again for the series of webinars that SLM is conducting in collaboration with World Health Organization. And the topic of today's webinar is again a very important one that is COVID-19 and mental health, a very important and timely topic. And today I'll be joining with uh, my co-moderator and co-chairperson Dr. Suranta Pereira from the SLMA Council. And this symposium is, this webinar is organized in collaboration with the College of Psychiatrists. And we have three eminent panel of resource persons who will be sharing their knowledge and experience related to this very important topic. To start with the webinar, I'd like to invite Professor Tilin Rajapaksha, who is Professor of Psychiatry from University of Peradeniya. And she will be talking about suicide and self-harm in the context of COVID-19. Dr. Tilini, over to you. Thank you, Indika. Thank you for that introduction. I will just share my slides. I hope everybody can see my slides. Indika, is it showing? Uh, yeah, you need to put in a side show view. Yes. Okay. So thank you very much for the introduction, Indika. Um, so I'm starting off this presentation and I'll be talking a little bit about um, suicide and self-harm in the context of COVID. But to give a little background, I first thought I'll have a look at what the evidence shows about psychiatric illness during this time. So COVID-19, oh, let me see. Okay, so this is looking at has psychiatric illness really changed during COVID-19? Um, so it's, although it seems like a long time to us, it's just been a year of the pandemic and we don't have a lot of evidence. This is a systematic review done in May this year, mostly from the developed world. And as you can see, they've identified an increase of common psychiatric disorders like anxiety, depression, distress, um, in the general population during this COVID period, which is partly to be expected given the situation. And in the anxiety, it's a lot of health related, related anxieties, OCDs, panics. Interestingly, this review coming from the developed world did not highlight very much the substance abuse problem. Whereas for Sri Lanka, I think together with these anxiety related problems, we are also seeing the issue of substance misuse, particularly opioid misuse and withdrawal, which is a problem we are dealing with. So then the question arises, do we, is the COVID-19 related psychiatric morbidity, is it purely a psychological phenomenon related to psychological stressors or is there a biological basis to this? Does COVID-19 itself, does the immune response that comes secondarily to it have a role to play in the fact that people might be developing this psychiatric sequelae? We don't know really, we know, in, uh, but the early evidence suggests that probably not. We don't, we're not sure, but the early evidence has some, there are a few studies looking at um, baseline inflammatory markers and the occurrence of psychiatric symptoms. At the moment, there seems to be no association biologically. So who is more vulnerable to develop disorders like anxiety or depression during the period of COVID? So there are several studies highlighting women as being more vulnerable. Now at this point, uh, there may be male colleagues in the audience or even some of the male co-panelists with me who might complain, why are we always highlighting women in a situation like this? But this is what the papers, the data shows. And we don't know why, but the possible theories are, um, one is when it comes to the labor market, um, if women tend to be in more short-term jobs, they might be more likely to face unemployment early. They also might be carers for dependent children and elderly people and hence might have more anxiety around that. Or it might be just a biological phenomena. We also see that the studies also suggest that younger people, particularly students who've had their lives and schooling disrupted, and young people, unemployment people might suffer more with these kind of anxiety, depression related disorders. Obviously anybody with a past psychiatric history or a medical disorder might be a little more vulnerable. And last but not least, what we already know, getting repeatedly bombarded by information about COVID-19, information and misinformation itself 
can worsen anxiety. Interestingly, there some of the work, a few work has also looked at what can be predictive, what can help avoid psychiatric morbidity during the period of COVID-19. And one interesting systemic uh, suggestion was that having accurate, timely, updated information from trusted authorities is actually useful in the sense that it might make you feel more in control of a bad situation as opposed to misinformation from a, and a lot of information from a lot of bad sources. Being on an individual level, actively feeling in control by you know, doing precautionary measure, measures may be helpful. And of course, then our own personalities also come into play. Some of us might have more positive coping skills, the others might tend to get more anxious and worried during uh, such health situa threat situations. So that's the psychiatric morbidity part, but what do we know about actually suicide and self-harm during COVID, both internationally and in Sri Lanka? Well, although COVID, like I said, has been, seems to have been with us for such a long time, with regards to something like suicide and self-harm, it's a short period, it's only one year, and we don't have a lot of formal evidence for this year. We can look at past pandemics, or past epidemics and see what happened then. And although Sri Lanka, we've been fortunate that we haven't had this, sorry, the spelling error on influenza. Um, in Taiwan, for example, in the 1900s, they had an influenza pandemic, which has quite led to a lot of similar restrictions, uh, social distancing, institutions closing, and people have studied what happened to suicide rates during this time. And they had two waves of the illness. And during the first wave, in the first few months of the pandemic, or the epidemic, sorry, there actually was no change in suicide rates, which is encouraging. But the second wave, a few months later, did see a slight increase in suicide rates by about one third. And the thinking was that perhaps by that time, people were feeling the um, long-term effects of the lockdown that happened, including financial issues. And that might have contributed to the increased rate of suicides in the second wave. We can also look at it from a practical common sense point of view and look at the known risk factors for suicides. So obviously a past history of illness or past history of suicidal behavior would make you more vulnerable, but it's never that simple. So it's suicide and self-harm are never the result of one isolated thing. It's always a complex interplay of multiple factors. Um, some of them we all know, psychiatric illness, past self-harm, substance misuse. Um, the other special things we are going to particularly see during COVID and post-COVID uh, is this amalgamation of anxiety about illness, shame and stigma around getting the illness, particularly in countries such as ours, which I'll touch on again later and the enormous financial stresses that are going to continue. And in Sri Lanka, or maybe countries like Sri Lanka compared to the West, we face a sort of unique stress in our pattern of quarantine and lockdown, which involves quite a severe isolation, um, separation from family. If you are a daily wage earner, you're removed from working for an extended period of time, so that indirectly contributes to all the other stressors. The West talks a lot about this stress of isolation, which is applicable to us too. But I think in the developing world, we also have the problem of the other extreme. We are because of these quarantine lockdowns, we are, um, it might be that people actually kept together with a lot of extended family, a lot of people whom you have to get on with. And that itself also can be a stressor. And in some cases, if, they, if it's in a household with domestic violence, for example, those kind of stresses are going to be exacerbated. So it's really a very complex interplay of all these um, factors that are going to affect rates of suicide and self-harm during COVID. So given that, what is our role? What do we do? Again, common sense approach provision of services and enabling novel methods of provision of services. 
So strategies to stay well, I know the Sri Lanka College of Psychiatrists has already been active in this regard. There's been lots of um, psychiatrists and the college putting out videos for the general public on anxiety management. Um, we also need to look at, and also things like novel, you know, uh, provision of hotlines, phone contact, posting people their medication, all of those are often really useful because the challenges people face are not just difficult in accessing services, but when they do come for services, say, if they come, if somebody comes from a place of lockdown and they come to a healthcare provider, often the healthcare provider also reacts with anxiety because of the risk of exposure. And the risks are that such people might not get the services they require. So that is something we need to guard against. I need not really highlight this, the importance of not exacerbating the stigma and shame around having COVID, which really is nothing to be shamed about, but perhaps because our healthcare system is going hand in hand with the military, there is a sort of sense from the media that anybody who has COVID is the guilty party, which is so that even getting, even if you're an asymptomatic positive person, it's an enormous stressor for that individual. And that itself can lead to a lot of psychiatric distress and psychological morbidity. So you're trying to minimize trauma to persons with COVID while also managing anxiety and stress in the general population. I would like to touch again on this issue of economic stressors because what we know is this is going to outlast the actual pandemic. And what we know from past economic recessions from the US, for example, um, the quote is that a 1% increase in unemployment is also associated with a 1% increase in suicide rates. And it doesn't affect everybody equally. It's a complex thing. So economic, the rate of the economic disparity matters. And also you are more likely to see in a time of economic depression, you're more likely to see suicides among uh, people with unskilled jobs and more among males compared to females. So can we do anything about this? Can we plan ahead? Can governments have safety nets to bail out people facing acute crises? are things we need to think about. And you might also question, will it help? Do things like benefits and bailouts help? Actually, there's some evidence on this. There's some research on this and this, it, the suggestion is, what it shows is clear, fairly generous benefits from governments have actually played a role in reducing suicide rates. There are some papers suggesting this. So that's things to think about. <laughs> So let's actually look at the data on suicide. What do we know about the suicide rate so far? The good news is worldwide, this is in the developed world, for now, we are not seeing an increase in suicide rates. But it is a very dynamic thing, it, it, suicide rates change. And what we might need to guard against is the future months when perhaps the pandemic becomes less, but the economic repercussions continue we might see changes in suicide and self-harm rates. Data from Sri Lanka for the moment we have, we've actually looked at hospital admissions for self-poisoning during this COVID period. I don't have data on actual suicides, but I do have data on self-poisoning attempted. And I thought I would share that with you before I finish up. So this is on, obviously it's limited, it's only for TH Peradeniya, but we looked at the number of people who got admitted to teaching hospital Peradeniya because they had deliberately taken a poison and they had come for medical management. And this is the year of 2020. And um, this is part of some ongoing work. We are doing a collaborative project that's ongoing at the moment. And you can see with the lockdown in March, our hospital admissions for attempted self-poisoning dropped dramatically and picked up a little again after we opened up. And part of it, you could be thinking it's because it was curfew, people couldn't come to hospital. Um, so perhaps people were poisoning themselves at home and being treated at home. Or perhaps they were really not poisoning themselves for some other reason. Um, and so those are the kind of questions we had. And when we broke it down by gender, what we found is that the, the color coding is actually reversed. 
the red dots show you the male admissions, the blue dots show you the female admissions. And you can see the male admissions for attempted self-poisoning have been relatively constant this year. Whereas the female admissions with the lockdown have shown a dramatic decrease and increased again with the lockdown in the East. So it could be again that females have less mobility in you are less likely to come to the hospital, less likely to have substances to ingest, or there is a real change where we saw um, a drop in female suicide rates, uh, female self-harm rates during lockdown for some reason. Um, and females also tend to take more medicinal overdoses. So what we saw when we looked at the type of poison ingested this year, the red dots show you medicinal overdoses, the blue shows you pesticides. And as you can see, the most significant drop has been in medicinal overdoses, which is also what females most commonly take. So um, there seems to be an actual fall in the rates of medicinal overdoses by females during the period of lockdown and COVID. Um, after opening up, I personally haven't heard that the females, that there were a lot of self-poisoning in homes which were not reported, but I'd be interested to hear from my colleagues what they found in their experience. So our question is what next, if we know this is the situation and these are the risk factors. It's always challenging trying to reduce self-harm and suicide, but as I've said before, it's always has to be a multifactorial approach. It's not health only, it's many different approaches in compensating the different stressors we discussed. And the focus would be, uh, it's, it's advisable to have a national program and a plan, a cohesive plan, and address known risk factors for suicide and self-harm, as well as our COVID-specific risk factors. And you're looking at universal prevention at a population level, general measures, as well as targeted support of vulnerable individuals while monitoring our rates and what we're doing. So that's really what I had to say for today. Those are my references and the acknowledgements of the ongoing research projects. I think I'll stop there. And if anybody has any questions that I can answer, I'd be happy to take it. I think we have a few minutes. I'll stop the screen share. Thank you. Tilini, what we will do is we'll do the complete the presentations and then uh, move into the questions once this okay. over. However, yeah. if the participants have any questions, they can ask to the chat also so that you can respond to them uh, so that everyone can see. In that way, we can cover a lot of areas. So I would like to invite my co-chair, Dr. Suranta Pereira, uh, to introduce the next speaker. Over to you, Suranta. Thank you. Yeah, thank you very much, uh, Professor Indika, uh, President uh, SLMA, and uh, hello, Tilini, and welcome to all of you. I'm Suranta. Uh, so the, our next speaker would be Dr. Mirsa Jamaldi. Uh, she's a, a senior registrar in psychiatry at Teaching Hospital Peradinia. She, will, she would talk about mental health issues related to COVID-19 case scenarios. What do you think, uh, Mirsa? Thank you, sir. I am Mirza Jamaldin, uh, working as senior registrar in teaching hospital for Peradeni. I would uh, like to thank uh, the organizers for giving this opportunity. And uh, I would share my screen. Yes. Uh, so my topic today is mental health issues related to COVID-19. So I would present three cases which we have uh, came across during this period of COVID. And my first case will be Mrs. A, who's a 21-year-old mother of three-month-old baby. She's a housewife from Paliagoda, and she was referred to psychiatric services with excessive crying, demanding discharge from COVID treatment center, and refusing meal. And she was all also feeling sadness while at the treatment center at Dambadenia. And she was apparently well two weeks ago. Her husband had caused close acquaintance with COVID patients in Paliagoda. Her husband tested positive for COVID and he was admitted to IDH COVID hospital as he was symptomatic. During the contact testing, he was uh, also tested, she was also tested positive and she was taken to Dambadeni COVID treatment center along with her three month old baby 
and uh, relatives and neighbors as they were asymptomatic and uh, though she was distressed about husband becoming ill being away from home and taking the child with her to the covid treatment center she was optimistic about leaving the center in 14 days of time and uh, she received emotional and physical support from her relatives and neighbors while at the covid treatment center however uh, on 12th day during the 12th day during uh, routine pcr testing her baby tested positive for covid infection and she had to stay further 14 days in the quarantine center with her infant while other supporting neighbors were leaving the treatment center and following that she felt extreme distress and uh, not being able uh, like uh, extreme distress about not being able to join with her family members and she had guilt related to baby becoming positive and she was fearful to stay in the treatment center alone and uh, due next two days she was feeling depressed and was excessively crying refusing meals and she was demanding discharge she expressed suicidal ideas and threatened to harm herself if they don't discharge her she denied any attempts no expressed any infanticidal ideas there was no evidence suggestive of psychotic symptoms and she also refused to take care of the child therefore she was transferred to base hospital mulleria for further assessment she had no family history of psychiatric illness and in her personal history she had a carefree childhood she denied any significant stressors in her personal life and this was her first child and she was uh, uh, supported by her mother and her husband in caring the infant she was uh, not a diagnosed patient with psychiatric illness and there was no past history of self harm and she didn't have any medical comorbidities either premorbidly she had been a very caring and responsible person but she was anxious and dependent mainly dependent uh, anxious and sensitive and she was dependent on her family members in the mental on the mental state examination uh, she was a female of stated date who was fearful and was in distress she was attending to child's need and could notice good bond, uh, good bonding between the child and patient her speech was normal in rate and volume her subjective and objective mood was depressed and it was less reactive and she did not have any suicidal ideas or infanticidal ideas she was feeling guilt related to baby's infection and was distressed about not being able to go home and was anxious about complication to baby with uh, due to the infection and there was no evidence of psychotic symptoms or any perceptual disturbances and she had a good insight into her illness and uh, so while we were managing we managed her as a adjustment reaction with depressive type with low dose of benzodiazepine and also with psychological support uh, mainly reassurance and supportive therapy so actually in this case scenario i wanted to highlight uh, how social isolation quarantine procedures and guilt about infecting the loved ones can precipitate mental health problems and how important the community support and the family support as in this patient initial period they have act as protective factors so next i move on to my second case where this is a mr x who is a 42 year old three wheel driver from pilimathalava and he is a father of three children he was referred by medical team uh, for the uh, to the psychiatric services and two weeks back he woke up from his sleep drenched in sweat and feeling of choking he reported racing heart difficulty in breathing with hyperventilation and numbness of peripheries associated with overwhelming fear that he is about to die uh, this episode lasted for nearly 20 minutes duration and his medical assessment did not reveal any abnormality over the past two week duration uh, he was fearful having, of having another attack uh, similar attack actually and could not attend to work as usual which further aggravated his uh, uh, financial problems in this covid situation this was not occurring in the context of depressive symptoms phobic symptoms and there was no evidence suggestive of generalized anxiety disorder 
However, uh, however, like uh, he had multiple stressors and worries in the recent past. Thus, I would like to start with the personal history uh, here. So he had a, a difficult childhood where he was uh, uh, he was victimized and witnessed domestic violence. He was the breadwinner in the family, and uh, there were five people dependent on his income. And during those uh, violent incidents, he could he he was feeling helpless as he could not save his mother. Once he got married, his mother moved out and lived with his family. And his father lived with his sister, and he still consumes alcohol. And Mr. X was uh, like, since the beginning of the uh, COVID pandemic, he was learning more and more about the COVID infection via the mainstream media and also from the social media. He learned that the elderly patients with physical comorbidities are vulnerable to COVID infection and its complications. And uh, so he was worried about his elderly mother, who was a 65-year-old patient with diabetes and bronchial asthma and contracting the illness. And he was further stressed by the financial problems due to lockdown and curfew. And during this period, he mainly got three-wheel hires to hospitals to transport either patients or hospital staff. So reluctantly, he had to work to feed his family. He was persistently worried about COVID infection, but he didn't believe, uh, he didn't have significant fear of him contracting the virus. Rather, he was uh, worried about his family, especially his mother. But he could not send the mother back home due to past uh, bad experiences. So, and his uh, worry got worsened uh, when he noticed more and more cases were uh, reported from Central Province. Due to this worry, he had difficulty in falling asleep and was distressed over the past two week duration and presented with current symptom. So uh, in this patient, there was no family history of psychiatric illness. No, he was a diagnosed patient with psychiatric illness in the past and he didn't have any significant medical illness either. And pre-morbidly, he was very anxious and sensitive person. He, he was very worrying excessively about trivial matters and especially well-being of his illness. And he ha was fearful when one of his family members got ill. And on mental state examination, he was an average male, male who was sitting on the edge of the chair. And he was cooperative and I could build good rapport with him during my interview. And his speech was normal in rate and volume. His mood was subjectively and objectively anxious. He was fearful about, his, uh, about another similar panic attack and worried about mother's well-being and financial problems. There was no evidence of depressive cognitions or psychotic symptoms. And there was no perceptual disturbances. And his physical uh, examination did not reveal any abnormalities. So in this patient, we manage his condition as panic attack, mainly with psychological management. However, we arrange follow-up care as there is high likelihood of progression into panic disorder because he presented to us with a nocturnal panic attack. So in this presentation, I mainly want to highlight how media, including the social media, Lockdown, curfew, e economic crisis due to lockdown and curfew, and fear about infecting the loved ones has uh, precipitated, uh, precipitated mental health problems, even in the general population. So with this, I move on to my third case. So my third case is also a somewhat interesting case. Uh, it, it's a Mrs. Uh, B, who's a 45-year-old mother of four. And uh, she, uh, one, this is five years back. And she's a housewife from Kaduvannava. She was brought by her family members due to excessive worshipping, overactivity, poor sleep for two weeks duration. And she also firmly believed that she has power rested by God Vishnu to wipe out the COVID infection from the world. She believed that uh, her extreme spirituality 
will prevent the illness and she was immune to covid infection thus she used to challenge science and uh, tried to go to temple even without mask when her tr daughter tried to stop her she believed daughter was conspiring against her and this uh, and she was uh, during this period she was irritable towards daughter however there had been no aggressive behavior she shouted uh, at the neighbors claiming that their alcohol abuse uh, use was a curse to the world and the covid infection was a punishment and uh, then she presented with this uh, symptoms are suggestive of mania and there was no evidence uh, suggestive of any organic pathology uh, during this uh, to this presentation and this was the help uh, like though this was a presentation to psychiatric services uh, psychiatric services and uh, since covid positive cases were reported in sri lanka she was worried about the infection and well being of her family members and children and she resorted to spirituality as a way of coping the stress and she was listening to special programs religious programs actually and chanting in the radio in view of prevention from covid infection she was listening to those program excessively where she woke up early morning at 4 am and mostly uh, and mostly she remained awake till midnight this was aggravated following the that navy cluster and she, as uh, she was worried about her elder daughter who was working work at uh, in air force and about one month back she was preaching the family members about adhering to the religious rituals then believing the science and she also expressed willingness to enter into robes and she uh, used to skip meals and she was deprived of sleep due to this extreme engagement in the religious activity and uh, there was there was uh, in the past psychiatric history uh, she had a, a history like uh, about 5 years back she lost her younger son by an accidental drowning she could not accept the unexpected death and had evidence suggestive of uh, complicated grief amounting to depress depression since the death her uh, since the death of her son actually she resorted to spirituality which was unusual to her nature and there was no history uh, past history suggestive of manic episodes or other psychiatric illness she had a family history of psychiatric illness suggestive of mood disorder among the second degree relatives she was educated up to o level and there was no significant stressors in her personal or marital life and there she was not a diagnosed patient with any medical illness and premorbidly she had been a caring and responsible lady on a mental state examination she was a uh, female of stated age and she was over familiar and over confident during the interview and she was challenging me uh, that the science uh, challenged the science and was preaching to adhere to religious activity her speech was increased in rate and volume and her mood was elevated her affect range from euphoria to irritability and there was liability noted in her affect her thought content consists of grandiose delusion where she firmly believed that she is the chosen one and has special uh, powers vested by god vishnu to cure the world from covid infection and she also had persecutory idea and there was no perceptual disturbances and her insight was poor and physical examination uh, was normal actually during the ward stay we uh, excluded uh, organic causes for the first presentation of first episode of mania and she was managed as a first episode mania in a probably in a patient with bipolar affective disorder so in this case i actually may mainly want to highlight uh, that uh, how stress related to covid infection an effect of media where she had excessively listening to these religious sermons and ways of preventing covid infection and also the worry about her daughter getting infected who's the frontline worker 
uh, all together has uh, disturbed her social zeitgeber and she had been a vulnerable person actually where she had a family history of bipolar affective disorder due to that uh, she presented with manic first episode of manic mania so how this all uh, this uh, stressors has acted and disturbed her social zeitgebers to uh, precipitate a manic effect episode and uh, those are the cases i wanted to present and this is in uh, this image actually illustrate the relationship between covid-19 infection and mental health issues in a nutshell which uh, my previous speaker was spoken to you you all and thank you thank you mr for that informative lecture and we are moving to the final lecture which would be done by dr gihan abewadana he is from he is a consultant psychiatrist from teaching hospital kandy and he is the president of the sri lanka college of psychiatry and the theme would be how to manage psychiatric manifestations during covid 19 dr gihan abewadana can start the lecture now first of all uh, thank you very much uh, to the sri lanka medical association for giving us this opportunity Uh, to talk about uh, covid-19 and mental health issues uh, as it's very important uh, that has, uh, that usually sideline is just uh, i'll try to share my yeah. can you see the screen now why why dr gihan is connecting if the audience have any questions uh, they can answer them uh, i think thilini you are there isn't it hi hi uh... Yes. Yeah. Uh, if audience has any questions, or oh, there are some questions in chat also, so that you can provide the answers. I think I've been uh, we've been chatting uh, on the on the chat, and what I can see is we cannot hear you. Oh, sorry. Can you hear me now? I'm not muted. Yes. Okay. So yes. there's been a quite a lot of questions on chat, and a lot of a uh, lot of the questions have been about this issue of stigma. because of the way that the covid positive patients are being faced um and i think that's an important point um because i think partly because the military and the health are working together to achieve this it, i mean it's not might be necessary in the sense of and uh, perhaps that something we need to hey, talk about i think so i think a lot of the discussion is about whether we can do something about whether we can at least talk to the media about not um uh, not presenting all covid positive patients as bad guys or the criminals uh, but they are really patients and the military is helping us to find patients um so that was a, a big discussion on chat did anybody else have questions to ask on anything else uh, sirini i think now uh, dr gihan is online so yeah okay. he can start the presentation now so the main things contributing uh, to mental health problems in the pandemic uh, as already uh, mentioned earlier it's mainly the loneliness um the past history of trauma relationship problems that people have and uh, ongoing current events and the threat by the corona virus of course the grief and loss and financial problems and uh, if you can see this screen now the these are data from the united states of america about the spike in anxiety and depression during the covid-19 pandemic um how in january last year um, the symptoms of anxiety disorder has increased the red column shows us the rate of anxiety disorders uh, in may 2020 and then the next one the symptoms of depressive disorder how from 6.6 it has increased up to 24.4% and the symptoms of anxiety or depressive disorder together it's from 11% last year to 33.9% in may 2020 so these are data from um, on the impact of covid-19 pandemic on the mental on mental uh, health and well-being of uh, americans in the united states of america so overall there's 40.9% uh, of us adults have reported at least one adverse mental health or behavioral health problems 
during uh, June 2020. So in uh, and out of that, 31% experience anxiety or depression, uh, with 30% experiencing both, and 26% PTSD, 13% their uh, level of substance use, use has increased, and 11% are contemplating suicide, have been contemplating suicide in the past month, and 63% uh, of the young adults between 18 to 24 have reported anxiety and depression, and 25% reporting increased substance use and have been contemplating suicide. And these are the common reactions we may experience during a pandemic. Generally, general apprehension, anxiety, and uh, not knowing what's going to happen, and uh, fears around health and health of uh, your health and the health of loved ones. Getting sad most of the time, losing interest, hopelessness, financial and economic problems, and stress and irritation towards uh, those around you. So what to do when we have these symptoms of anxiety during a pandemic? Just to pause, breathe, reflect, and it's very important to connect with the others and keep to a healthy routine. And also be nice to yourself and others. And uh, if at all necessary, reach out for help if you need it. Okay, and now the... Sri Lanka College of Psychiatrists, along with the National Institute of Mental Health in Angoda, where we have uh, stretched our services to the general public as well as the healthcare workers during the pandemic uh, in the country. And um, if anyone in the public, the general public, they want any help, issues or depressive symptoms or any panic in a panic situation uh, anyone can dial 1926 and there's a dedicated team to answer your calls and if necessary refer you or direct you to the um, closest possible center where you can get help from either a mental health care professional or a mental health care unit Busy working and getting uh, anxious and depressed regarding their own health. Uh, this is the hotline that can be um, contacted. It's easy to remember 071 2 578 578. And uh, a consultant psychiatrist um, will most, uh, most of the time answer this, get you help when and when necessary. Okay, and these are the six steps that we should take to protect us during a pandemic as well as others. And care for yourself uh, during the COVID-19 pandemic and then um, develop activities to help individuals struggling with the pandemic. Minimize the psychological effects of COVID-19 on children and explain the role of parents and caregivers during the pandemic and outlining the leader's role as well as the manager's role. So we'll take one by one. And uh, these are most of the data are from the United States of America where they have done quite a lot of research and um, they have come out with this six step approach to help yourself and others during a pandemic. So uh, care for your mental health during COVID-19 as this applies to general public as well as uh, healthcare workers. The importance of staying informed and educating others and uh, uh, be prepared to take talk about the fear of dying and lo loss with adults and children and uh, to get the correct information. And if you get misinformation for the public media to correct it and encouraging the limiting of media exposure. Now we are bombarded with quite a lot of information by public media and social media and uh, not all the information that we... So, does any, it is also an opportunity for anybody to ask questions or make comments? If they wish. If anyone wants, uh, yeah. you, you, you can, can put, put your hands up. Yeah. Tilini, I have a question. Okay, good. Thanks, sir. The question is, uh, you have shown the increase of, uh, increased number of 
mental illnesses in this uh, C-19 or COVID-19 pandemic uh, period. That's uh, right. What about the specific uh, areas like uh, cohorts like uh, children? Uh, I mean, the, it's a real challenging, really challenging environment for them because the, they used to uh, mix with their friends. School is the platform. They lost it. And then uh, tuition classes, they lost it. And then uh, neighbors, they can't go and mix with them. I mean, it's very difficult. Yep. Um, there's def so what, uh, there's definitely evidence to show that the, the common disorders like anxiety and depression are greater among younger people. That includes adolescents. That wasn't specifically looking at very young children, but in adolescents, and that's again the school going age. They are, you know, their whole lives have been disrupted. Exams have been disrupted in Sri Lanka and all over the world. And also when you're a teenager being separated from all your friends, as you said. Um, so yes, among that group, it has been shown that particularly anxiety and stress related disorders are more, have been, there's been a relative increase. Tila, um, Dr. Padmagunrata, you have a question. Yeah, uh, may I ask Tilini now uh, what, what is, uh, could Tilini hear me? Yes, madam, I can hear you. Yeah, what is your opinion with regard to psychological impact and uh, uh, consequences of these strong uh, believers who are not being able to cremate bodies? Uh, so the, 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 the fact that cremation is not allowed. Yes, that's right. So they, I mean, for certain not categories, it's not allowed, is it? it, it that, now there is a certain category, Islamic believers that who, I mean, sort of strong believers that who, who are very much disturbed because that the cremation is not allowed. And what could be the psychological sort of uh, consequences of uh, this law for this particular community? So this is where the burials are not allowed, madam. Um, definitely it would cause a lot of, I mean, distress, psychological distress. It may not necessarily, I mean, we don't have evidence that it will cause psychological disorders per se, but it will definitely cause distress. And I know of um, how it does cause distress and also because it's your belief systems. Yeah? Yeah. Yes, that's if right. In, uh, if you believe in something, and this is what you grew up with to suddenly change it is not possible. Right? And it causes a lot of conflict and distress. So if there, if there, I mean, if there is a scientific reason to not to allow, is there anything that as doctors that we could offer this community? It's, if there is a scientific, I mean, if it has to be done, yes. when giving giving an explanation as to why it cannot be done logically and offering some um, other have support such as they want to do very quickly or delay in times, things so if we can make other compromises on that behalf and perhaps link if there is actual reasons it's needed, link with their religious leaders so that they could um, perhaps, you know, be with us on this issue. Um, say if the religious leaders are also saying that this you know, if you don't bury, then it's going to be have a terrible outcome. And if they're accentuating it, that makes yeah. it worse. <laughs> All right. So, All right. Uh, can I can I add something to this, Tilini? And yes, uh, yeah. Uh, now uh, it's for uh, it's of a special concern for this particular community and for everyone else. Uh, now there is uh, now all these uh, uh, rituals re regarding uh, uh, once a person passed away. Uh, they they grieve during this process, and for everyone, uh, the, this is the cremation happens within about a day, and there is no usual process of grieving according to their own belief system anyway. So I think it can affect anyone, not particularly uh, a particular uh, sub community. I know particularly the this Muslim community is affected uh, a lot, but other than that, all the others are also affected because of all the uh, like uh, the all these things happen in a very uh, sudden way. No one is allowed to keep the body at their home, so uh, the grieving normal grieving process is uh, abruptly uh, halted. Yeah. Thank you. Thank okay. you. We will move to the discussion again. So, 
the the importance of taking care of your mind and keeping to a regular routine limiting the news media exposure staying busy focusing on the positive thoughts and uh, connecting with the others and getting help when you need it and these are the activities that will help individuals uh, when they are struggling with the pandemic i will not spend much time on that and go to the num step number 3 what are the psychological effects of covid 19 on children so children are a very vulnerable group they are likely to experience uh, worry anxiety and fear similar to adults and uh, it's a they may have a fear of dying or fear of a close relative of theirs their parents dying and fear that uh, fear of having medical treatment like the ventilator which has which has been shown uh, repeatedly on uh, the public media and then if schools are being closed as part of a necessary measure children may have the, have problems of structure and getting not stimulated so and they have no not much opportunities to be with their friends and get social support that's very essential for mental health uh, well being and uh, oh, because of this online virtual school approach they have problems with structure need for exercise and meeting with their friends so these are the things that are quite important when dealing with um, children so for young children it's always uh, very important to be available as parents and teachers and caregivers um, in close distance so this time i want to ask a question from you all yes yes go ahead please uh, regarding i am here so i i so in the yesterday media and there are some ministers and all these saying these psychotic drugs are very violent and making a violent environment what is this uh, actual opinion and this uh, i also have a one family member in cycle we are giving them this is a giving a mental health big uh, blow is will people are there are only for i think in the country 10 to 15 percent will come to the western medicine and yeah. this is what's your opinion this at the one and i'm very thanks to you you are coming in the correct time to people need mental health development yeah. can you explain it and i want to add one thing this uh, normally for medical doctor there are other areas are mostly they knows the psychological areas are very weak uh, and one mbbs doctor this is also one issue in the country and you can bring it something is a university students are not trained medical students and i feel strongly feel in this area and this is uh, what's your opinion um two very good points mr zawahir um i really appreciate it dr um regarding the first point i completely agree i mean that was a strong misrepresentation of the actually formal the statement the strong statement already to clarify and say that uh, psychiatric medication does not cause violence and addiction and that's a document misrepresentation of a different problem so i completely agree with you that was really negative and the college has already given a strong statement about this which is i think now out there and the second point is that um, uh, regarding um, uh, psychological know how of medical doctors well i think the biggest step we've taken is we moved to having psychiatry as a separate finally a subject in all medical schools in sri lanka so that's just been a few years so it's now people who are qualifying now as general mbbs doctors apart from medicine surgery gyn ops and uh, pediatrics they also do psychiatry so hopefully um, the future generations would be different um, and that's why we did that's why that was done thank, thank you very much uh, i think because of the interest of time uh, yeah i know for no time now. yeah can i invite dr gran to make his concluding remark okay. the connectivity seem to be a problem yeah 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 so if he can make his uh, summary like a concluding remark that would be great again uh, can i invite 
Professor Tilin Rajpaksha again to make the concluding remarks on behalf. Oh, right. Um, um, well, I, we apolo I apologize on behalf of all of us for, you know. Can you? Agiman, are you back? Can you? Indika would like you to make Okay, some... yeah, yeah. So, uh, so let, let Dr. Gihan make his concluding remarks. Yeah, yeah. Um, no, no need to share yes. this. Time. I mean, you can make your concluding remarks because there seem to be some connectivity issue. Yeah, may, yes. The most important thing um, is to uh, cope with the stress during the COVID-19 outbreak. And uh, because I want to uh, conclude by telling that uh, it's normal to feel sad, stressed, confused during a crisis like this, but it's uh, always very important uh, to not get panicky, not, not get uh, overtly stressed. And uh, when you are in distress, talk to people, you can get help, contact your friends and family, and uh, always be aware that uh, everything that you hear about the virus is not true. And uh, it's very important to get the correct information and not always believe in what the social media or sometimes the public media tells you and to limit uh, your screen time as well as your exposure to media and uh, not always uh, be glued to breaking news uh, because you will be getting overwhelmed with uh, unnecessary uh, distressing information. And to um, draw on skills you have used in the past when you are under stress, uh, like uh, getting help from people, getting help from meditation, and um, managing your emotions during this outbreak. And it's very important that you stay healthy and safe uh, at home during a pandemic like this, uh, maintaining a healthy lifestyle, including a proper diet, sleep, exercise, and social contact with family and friends, and uh, not to medicate yourself, uh, self-medicate with uh, maladaptive coping mechanisms like alcohol, smoking, and illegal drugs. Thank you. And, uh... Uh, on behalf of Sri Lanka Medical Association and also World Health Organization, I'd like to thank all the resource persons and all the participants for their, this excellent session. And uh, uh, I apologies for the certain technical issues that has taken place. Anyhow, uh, this session will be edited and will be made available in our social media and other platforms, YouTube platforms, so that uh, you can follow this in the future as well. Now I'd like to request uh, Dr. Suranta Pereira, who is my co-chair, to conclude the session. Yeah, uh, thank you very much. And uh, today's uh, session was uh, done in collaboration with the Sri Lanka College of Psychiatrists. And so we were supported by uh, WHO Sri Lanka. Uh, first of all, I thank uh, two associations, the colleges. And then the, the lecturers, they did a superb job. Uh, first one was on... Uh, Suicide and self harm in the context of COVID 19. Professor Tini Rajapaksha did that and then followed with mental health issues related to COVID 19 case scenarios. Dr. Mirsa Jamaldin, thank you very much for, for two of you. And uh, Dr. Gihan Abhayawardhan had uh, some uh, issue with uh, probably due to technical problems. And uh, the lecture topic was how to manage psychiatric manifestation during COVID 19. And uh, this uh, lecture, the slides, would be available for the uh, uh, would be available in future, and uh, I love like to thank uh, President of the Sri Lanka College of Psychiatrists uh, for uh, coordinating this uh, program, uh, and then uh, our technical staff and Professor Indika and the, uh, other members of the SLMA. Finally, a small comment: uh, I know uh, two more uh, clinical meetings to be held, and uh, other colleges or the association took their did their best to uh, produce uh, excellent series of lectures. All these lectures would be compiled into one book, uh, e-edition. E if we have funding, we'll go for the printing. So I request uh, all the uh, listed out uh, uh, speakers to uh, convert it into a uh, word format, uh, less than 1,500. Please send to SLMA with that uh, 
uh, new thoughts uh, i'm winding off and thank you very much to all of you and have a great day thank you thank you